Ladies and gentlemen, this here is one of the best looking gaming PC builds that I've ever done. There's barely any RGB and it's smashing some 1440p in high gaming action. Let's have a look. Hey, welcome to Zach's Tech Turf. Today I'm gonna be showing you guys how to build this $1,000 new gaming PC build here in 2019. And then of course, we're gonna benchmark it. And if you're new here and you wanna see more PC building or benchmarking videos, then hit that subscribe button down below and also that notification bell. That way you never miss an episode. But before we get into it, let me quickly introduce the sponsor of today's video yet again, Dev Mountain. Dev Mountain is a 13 week class for all of you aspiring iOS and web developers out there. Their 13 week class focuses on providing you only the skills that you actually need to go out there and start your new career in coding. They don't waste time with a filler curriculum like at a traditional college. They also feature student housing at no extra cost, a variety of different classes, including UX design and QA testing. And most importantly, all of this is available at an affordable price. Head on down to that first link in the description to learn more if you're interested in getting that quick boost you need to start your new career in coding and design. All right, so this PC build is a little bit different different than the ones I normally do as it's definitely not the best performance bang for your buck kind of build and I definitely spent some extra money purely on aesthetics obviously. If you're one of those type of people that just has to spend every last dollar purely on performance then this video just isn't for you. I've made a lot of those type of videos though like this one up here but yeah hopefully this eliminates those comments like oh you shouldn't have bought those custom PSU cables and you should have got a better GPU but I'm sure we'll still hear them. Anyways, the first part up in this sexy AF Arctic themed build is the CPU. And here I went with the Ryzen 5 2600X and you could definitely go with just the 2600 if you wanna save a little bit of money. This CPU is rocking an impressive six cores and 12 threads clocked at 4.2 gigahertz. The 2600X is faster than the 2600 right out of the box. So I didn't overclock it for this video, but sure, if you wanna save a little money, then just go with the 2600. Next up we have the RAM and here I went with the Corsair Vengeance RGB 16 gigabyte kit clocked at 3000 megahertz and this part definitely came down to personal preference. I've said it so many times now but this older version of the Corsair RGB line is my absolute favorite looking RAM and with the white LED it matches our build perfectly. Speaking of matching the build perfectly next up we have our motherboard and this is the ASRock X370 Tachi and believe it or not this was the part that I struggled with the most. I don't know what happened but there's like no good white and black themed options with the new B450 or X470 motherboard so I had to go back to X370 which isn't a big deal but it could be if you don't do your homework. The reason why I say this is because the X370 motherboards don't work with the second generation Ryzen chips like our 2600X unless the BIOS is updated. I actually had to update mine, so make sure you find out if it's updated or not before you buy it. If your BIOS isn't updated, then your computer actually won't boot at all and you'll have to grab a Ryzen 1 series chip to get it in there and update the BIOS. I had a 1700X laying around, so please just make sure you do your homework if you're gonna copy this build. Next up, we have our GPU, and here I went with the brand new EVGA GTX 1660 Ti XC Black Edition, which I literally just made a dedicated review on last week. The GTX 1660 Ti is a great choice if you only have around $280 to spend on a GPU, but just be aware if you wanna spend like $70 more, the RTX 2060 would be a great option for you as well. Moving on past the core performance components, for storage, I actually went a different route than I normally take, and I went with this new Samsung 860 QVO one terabyte SSD. Buying a one terabyte SSD is still expensive, but with the price of SSD, SSDs still dropping, I don't think we're going to continue to see the small SSDs paired with the big HDDs as much as we do now. This 860 QVO isn't as fast as the 860 EVO, but it's certainly faster than any HDD, so in my opinion, the price is worth it to have all of your games running on this. The power supply was up next, and here I went with the Seasonic 620 watt bronze certified PSU, and the only reason I went with this one specifically was because I already had it in the studio. Feel free to go with any reputable 500 to 600 watt power supply, and you don't even need to get a good looking one because we have custom PSU cables. Speaking of which, these custom cables are from Easy DIY, and I found these on Amazon for just $27. These came with plenty of these see-through cable combs, and this thing definitely takes the build up a notch in terms of aesthetics. And finally, the last part of our $1,000 gaming PC build is the case, and huge thank you to NZXT for sending me their H500 mid tower, and honestly guys, I was tempted to make a dedicated video on this thing alone. Outside of looking baller, there were just so many little features and attention to detail that 
that I'm just not used to because I've been building in budget cases for so long now. The case feels super premium. There's plenty of room for a radiator up front with that swivel mounting bracket. There's a ton of room behind the case and under the PSU shroud to hide my extra cables. And I'm really digging the flush panel look on both the front and the rear side panels. Usually these things are sticking out, so it just looks so much cleaner. So there you have it. That's what the parts list is looking like. You can find all of these parts for a total of around $1,000 or even cheaper if you show a little bit of patience. If you have a 100% strict $1,000 budget and you can't go a dollar over, this rarely happens, let's just be honest. You could always swap out that one terabyte SSD for a 500 gigabyte SSD or even swap the 2600X for a 2600 and you'll be well under. With the parts list out of the way, it's now time for the benchmarks. And I don't know if you guys noticed this or not, but this is literally the exact same build that I just used in last week's video of the dedicated 1660 Ti review. So the results are gonna be the exact same. I'm gonna copy that part of the video into this slot. Sorry for being lazy. But yeah, it would be pointless for me to benchmark this thing all over again. The first game up was Apex Legends, and here I quickly realized that the GTX 1660 Ti was capable of 1440p gaming, so I jacked the settings up too high, and here I averaged an impressive 125 frames per second. However, please don't mind the noob gameplay, by the way. Speaking of noob gameplay, though, Fortnite was up next, and for this one, I could actually crank the settings up to 1440p in Epic, and here the 1660 Ti squeezed out an FPS average of 72. You could definitely get it towards the 144 FPS mark if you had a higher refresh rate monitor, I would guess that that would be around 1440p and medium settings. And for our last battle royale game for the day, PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds followed up next, and in 1440p and high settings, this system averaged 86 frames per second. Following that, I tested Counter-Strike Global Offensive. For this game, I definitely could have cranked it up to 1440p, but I realized that nobody plays this game above 1080p, so I put the settings at 1080p and high and averaged 127 frames per second. And finally, to wrap up our easier to run games, Rainbow Six Siege was at next, and with the built-in benchmarking tool, in 1440p and ultra settings, I averaged 100 131 frames per second. Getting into the newer and tougher to run games, make sure you check out my latest benchmarking videos because there's been a ton lately. Battlefield 5 followed up next and in 1440p in high settings, which looked absolutely beautiful, I averaged 75 frames per second. Next up, I fired up the Shadow of the Tomb Raider built-in benchmarking tool and in 1440p in high settings, I averaged 53 frames per second. You could definitely crank it down to medium if you wanted a smoother 60 FPS, but as you can see from the 1% and 0.1% lows, this was still a very smooth playing experience. The next built-in benchmarking tool I used was Assassin's Creed Odyssey. This is yet another really tough game to run, so feel free to check out my dedicated video on this one. And in 1440p and high settings, the GTX 1660 Ti could crank out 52 frames per second. Following that was the brand new Far Cry New Dawn, and with its built-in benchmarking tool in 1440p and ultra settings, I averaged just over our target 60 FPS mark. And finally, wrap up this benchmarking video with my absolutely least favorite game to benchmark. Metro Exodus was up, and in 1440p and high settings, I only averaged 37. Keep in mind that you'll get much better results actually playing the game compared to the benchmarking tool, but I just wanted to show you guys that even this brand new card struggles with this very annoying to benchmark game. Well, there you have it. That wraps up my $1,000 new Arctic themed gaming PC build. Make sure you guys let me know down in the comment section what you would have done differently because I know we definitely have some different opinions. After that, feel free to head on over to one of these two videos if you haven't seen them yet and definitely hit that subscribe button because later this week, we got another PC build guide coming. You don't want to miss that video.